What is your secret that you can't tell anyone because it will probably ruin your life? I have no idea what I'm doing at work. The amount of time I spend clicking my mouse on my empty desktop and writing gibberish into a Word doc, that I delete at the end of the day, is shocking. It you should write a book, instead. Five years before my stepdad died of Alzheimer's and leukemia, I noticed he was very quiet in the evenings when I visited him and my mom. I asked him why don't you want to talk a bit more? To which he responded if I don't say anything I can't say anything wrong. I took it to mean that he was afraid of conflicts with my mom, and said that I would want to hear anything he had to say. After he died I realized why he said what he said. I was at a lunch with him when he tried to ask me something but put in completely wrong nouns, nonsense choices, and every time he did that my mom started laughing and said ha ha ha, now you've totally gotten things weird. She didn't know she was being condescending because she didn't know he was getting advanced dementia, none of us knew then, and she just brushed his mistakes off as being silly mistakes. She couldn't know it shamed him so much that he stopped talking, since he didn't trust his words anymore, nor his sense of balance. I will never ever explain this to my mom, not even if I am super angry. I would do unretractable damage to my relationship with her, she mourned him deeply. Edit, to the heartless people insulting my mother over this post, she stood with my stepdad to the very end, sat with him in his room in the nursing home when he sometimes would scream for a half hour in mortal dread as he realized the consequences of his worsening condition. Those days would completely crush her, she suffered more than anyone I know have done, and also saw her own dad die of cancer in her youth, so you know nothing of her sacrifice. We buried him two weeks ago. I'm doing all I can to spend time with my mom at the cabin and cook great meals for her, do chores in the garden. My brother and his wife helps too. My grandma has Alzheimer's. It sounds really terrible to say, but I'm so happy my grandpa died before she got the disease. He was a mean bastard and he never would have brought her to the doctor. She'd be falling down the stairs right now, trying to do his laundry and make his food, all while being undiagnosed, if he were still alive, he'd be yelling at her and calling her stupid. Alzheimer's is fucking terrible. I'm sorry you're dealing with this, I know how devastating it can be. It doesn't hurt me much, but the things she says to my mom fucking tear me up. She was always such a sweet and quiet lady and I'm flat out baffled by some of the things she says now. My grandpa was a prick. He changed very briefly after his wife died and seemed like he was turning a new leaf. Got remarried and was back to the same old shit. He kept saying his new wife was acting like a child and was stupid and he'd say it to her face too. She died after about a year of marriage and had become increasingly more inept and bizarre. Well, turns out, they had gotten into a car accident several months prior to her death. Her Australian shepherd died in the accident so it must have been a doozy. Paramedics supposedly came and suggested my grandpa take his wife to the hospital to get checked out. He never did. She had a fucking brain bleed. That's why she was acting like that, because she was injured. Good riddance to my grandpa. There was no funeral and no one mourned. I hid the extent of my alcoholism from everyone since I was 15. I'm now 35 and 8 weeks sober. No one knows I'm sober now as they've never known I had an alcohol issue. This is me. I'm 27 and 95 days sober. No one in my life knows the extent of the drinking I did prior to getting pregnant in March. I plan to stay sober for my son when he is born and never go back to the place of hiding my alcoholism. Congratulations on two months sober. That's huge and incredible. Since no one in your life can tell you this, I will. It couldn't have been easy, but you did it and I'm immensely proud of you. All my passwords are the same word with different combinations of numbers and punctuation marks. A friend of mine's old roommate used the same answer for every security question, which was I like spaghetti. He said even though he knew what it was, the handful of times he wanted to get on his roommate's computer or into his uni email, he'd get most of the way through, then realize he didn't realize how to spell spaghetti in the moment without looking at it. Pro security tip, use a word you always spell wrong, but consistently, as your password. Dictionary attacks are gonna be much harder as it ain't even in a dictionary. And stuff like shoulder surfing. I have a bad back and from time to time it goes into a full spasm. One day I was getting out of bed, and as my foot hit the floor I went into a full spasm. I have no idea how, but a perfectly formed turd fell out the leg of my shorts and landed on the floor. Due to my spasm, I fell and landed right in the poop. The commotion woke up my GF at the time, and she ran over to check on me. I blamed the dog. I've never actually told anyone this before. Oh no. Babe come here. Someone shit in my pants. When my niece was little, she pooped her pants. My sister said, somebody pooped in their pants to try to talk about it with other adults without shaming the child. My niece excitedly exclaimed, somebody pooped in my pants.
I fall asleep every night in horror because my former best friend and I haven't talked in three years because for her 21st birthday we both got massively blackout drunk and smoked I have no idea what happened that night, but she's never answered a message I've sent since. Out of all the things I read so far which is a lot, this is the only one that got any kind of reaction out of me other than the man with dementia afraid to speak. Yep same because this sounds like the intro of a good horror movie. The story everyone knows is my boyfriend and I voluntarily left our place of work because our relationship went against policy, and we valued our relationship more than our crappy jobs. The truth is we got caught fucking in my car before work, and left in order to avoid repercussions. Sounds like the story you tell everyone is technically the truth. A, I guess technically, just cleaner. We both hated our jobs, but were too comfortable to leave. Once punishments were being discussed, it was a scary but easy decision. that I don't really have imposter syndrome, I'm actually a fraud. A fellow developer, I see. IT mainly, but I do game, escape room, and web development as well. The project I'm on now is a development project that'll help me monitor uptime of miscellaneous client equipment for the IT job and I'm going to adapt it for remotely controllable puzzles in the escape room. I'm 40 and my parents have no idea that I never actually graduated college. I went for almost 6 years and never felt like I really knew what I was doing. School wasn't necessarily hard for me but I just couldn't bring myself to focus or be dedicated to it. My parents were super obsessed with the idea that everyone needs a degree to get any decent job, so there was a ton of pressure and dropping out wasn't an option. So, I graduated in a winter semester and decided not to walk the stage since the December ceremony was always pretty small and I knew they wouldn't think that was weird. This happened to be during the recession in the 2000s so I had an excuse for not finding a conventionally professional job right after that. Now, I actually have a really good job with a company that focuses on hiring people based on experience, skill, and personality, so it turns out I didn't even need that degree. But I will never tell my parents the truth. Edit, dang, I did not expect this to get so many responses from others in a similar situation. Thanks for sharing your stories, I'm glad to hear that others were able to find their own way despite familial pressure. To those saying now it's on the internet and no longer a secret, this is an old throwaway account and I specifically switched over to post this comment. Also, I am aware that people have murdered over this type of lie, yikes, but I very much love my parents and I'm also not a raging psychopath, so worries on that front. Oh my god dude, I'm in the same boat. I was going to type the same thing and I just wanted to see anyone else has the same secret. I just feel a little relieved that there's someone else like me. I'm in a good position, and I think this secret will just disappoint everyone at this point so I am not ever bringing it up. Hey, glad I'm not the only one. I do sometimes wonder if I'd have been more dedicated if I'd had some time to think about what I actually wanted to do before committing to school. It's almost like I was interested in too many things and couldn't pick one. But again, time off to work or travel between HS and university wasn't an option. I left my job at an electronics manufacturing company in 2002, but they continued paying me my full salary including all incremental raises and annual bonus until they offered me a very generous redundancy package in 2022 due to departmental restructuring, including an £85,000 lump sum contribution to my pension fund. I even got the quarterly magazine and annual Christmas card sent to me. In March of this year, 2023, I got an invite to the 75th anniversary of the company, went along, had a great time at the free bar, and nobody realized I hadn't worked there for over 20 years. You've got to love a good administrative error. Maybe edit your post and remove the dates and info bro, don't want anyone finding out. Could already be the case. After fleeing domestic violence and trying to make a new life, I was diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. I'm fighting it but I'm just so tired of life. My last baby turns 18 this week and I feel like I've done all I'm supposed to. I'm sick of being strong for everyone else when all I want to do is go. I'm just so damn tired. Edit. Wow. Woke up this morning to this blowing up. I can thank everyone enough for the kind comments, messages and overall support. I have somewhat a better outlook on things, at least for today anyway, suppose just one day at a time. I wish I could bless you all with awards and thanks but for now upvotes will have to do. Thanks again, you don't know how much your kind words and thoughts mean to me. My uncle beat cancer three times. When it came around a fourth time he said fuck it, lived his best life until he ran out of time. You are entitled to that decision. My whole life has revolved around making sure my kids were okay and they have turned out great, all smart, either through university or attending now, I've never had a minute of trouble with them, and for that I am thankful, they haven't had it easy either watching me struggle. You could say they are my crowning achievement, I suppose really I just feel a bit like my job is done now and struggling to find a reason to fight on, my kids love me, 
and will always need me, but they shouldn't have to watch me struggle when they are just starting out on their own lives and adventures, I feel so selfish and guilty saying, I'm just done. People who work for the super wealthy, what stuff have you seen? The CEO of the company I worked for was the founder's son, not an unintelligent guy for the most part. His dad made him start with the most basic jobs in the company and work his way through the different departments. Managerial staff was ordered, upon penalty of termination, not to treat him any differently than a new hire. So when he became CEO he wasn't a bad guy to with four. Now, this is a company of over 10,000. One night, I'm working overtime on the late shift and we get this call. Hey! You guys, got electrician? The guy is clearly drunk, we have no idea who it is or why he's calling our maintenance slash engineering group. We ask who he is and he informs us, lightheartedly. He wants someone to take a ride to his house and figure out why the internet isn't working. This is an hour drive away. I volunteer, I was bored off my nut anyway. I get to the house, entry gate is smashed, section of the white horse fencing is gone, Jaguar is stuck in the field. Here in the house is dude, completely blasted. He's got a huge cut on his hairline. Are you okay, boss? I'm fine. Why? He asks, blood literally caked on his face. I accompany him to the bathroom and help him clean himself up, wash off the gash and put some bandaging on it. And then I corrected the internet. Unplug plug. As I'm walking out, he asks me to do a shot with him. I comment, worried about my job, that it might be a bad idea. He agrees and hands me the bottle. Take it home and do a shot later. Keep it. When I get back to work I look the stuff up. Never heard of it. It's a $1,500 bottle of scotch. The next day I'm at work early. About 11 in the morning he comes walking up. Ah. Uh, we're not going to be. Talking about last night? I tell him it's all good. Awesome. A little bit later I get an envelope. There's a check attached for emergency tech support $5,000. I was getting ready to hate this founder's son slash CEO but I kinda can't give him this story. Not his fault he was born into money. Sounds like he was raised right and he at least treats employees right. Emo that makes him miles better than some of the rich as I've met. P.S. Yikes looks like some of y'all got triggered. I'll just say yay drunk driving is very bad, and selfish thing to do. I totally had missed that bit while reading. The founder was smart with those orders to the company to treat him like new hire and make him go through the corporate ladder so he knows how things actually work. Not the craziest thing but wild to me. I was working for a kind of well-off family during a summer. I went inside to get a drink and the mom was cleaning the kitchen putting things away and such. She picks up a MacBook and says to me hey, do you want this? No one uses it got a brand new MacBook for college. My mom was a maid growing up, not for the hyper wealthy but for wealthy people. I got so much free shit growing up because of them it's insane. Clothes with tags on it, boxes of VHSs, I'm old, Game Boys, computers whenever they upgraded. It was actually really nice, because the people my mom worked for were very nice and generous. Sounds like my dad. He was IT for a company owned by a rich guy and the guy would have him test out gadgets before he bought one himself so my dad has always had a new, top of the line smartphone, iPad, laptop, etc. My brother-in-law builds custom homes in the Redneck Riviera Belt of Florida. One day, he called me to come over to this $15 million beach house he was doing a complete remodel of. He was the original builder. He asked me to bring my truck and trailer. I show up and he walks me through all four floors. He then says, the owners have removed all the stuff they want to keep. She has told me to dispose of everything as I see fit. Get what you want. Furniture, appliances, outdoor furniture, rugs, lamps, artwork, you name it. I don't know the value of everything I took home with me that day, but it was the highest end stuff I've ever seen. Four floors of it, and I only got one trailer load because I simply couldn't fit anything else in my house. I likely had over $20,000 worth of furniture and appliances on that trailer. Man, I would have rented a U-Haul and storage space. You possibly could have made six figures selling all that stuff. The owner's one stipulation was for personal use only. She didn't want to see it for sale. In her mind, she was giving to the less fortunate even though all the stuff I got went into my $500,000 home. The work crews that showed up got what was left. There was one dude who got one of the $3,000 outdoor furniture sets. There were 12 total occupying the four floors of outdoor balconies that he put in his house as dining room stuff. HTTPS colon slash slash www.wayfair.com slash outdoor slash PDP slash round four person 44 long bar height dining set HQV 10379.html. That's what we have now from that house. Design is a little different, but made of polywood. She said they were $3 grand a set.
Years ago I used to work carpentry mainly doing sunrooms. One of our clients was a brain surgeon who was married to a lawyer and they subsequently had a massive house on a large property. Their son was also some type of neuroscientist and with his parents' permission, had yet another massive house built on this same property. Problem is, city ordinances prohibit two separate livable dwellings on the same property. Mind you these houses were about a quarter mile away from each other. So to comply with the ordinances, they build a fucking wall between the houses. And this isn't just some dinky picket fence type of wall. It's a massive medieval style wall that has round towers with merlins and krennels, a gym midway through, and a massive $750k plus all glass sunroom all the while being wide enough to have room for a walking path and a road for golf carts. Inside the wall, the city ordinance said only one livable dwelling can be on their property, so they just made a massive hallway between their houses. Edit, I was able to find the video I took from years ago on my computer when we were on the job site scouting it out. My memory wasn't exactly correct but this gives you a good look at what it looked like. The steel structure you see near the end is where the sunroom was going to go. All we were providing was the glass. This is the very definition of fuck you money. And the funny part is they aren't even close to the super rich we read about. I used to work at a members only golf slash country club. There were members who had been actors, athletes, race car drivers, former CEO of Google, some major money and egos going on. There was one family that had three teenage kids, two girls and a boy. The mom and the girls were very attractive and knew it. They always looked amazing and had overly entitled attitudes to match. They were fancy. Well, the lady who washed the linens for the county club also did house cleaning for some members. This family was one of them. She said their multi-million dollar home was a disaster filth zone. They basically did no house work in between having the cleaning lady there. Dishes piled with dried food that smelled, dirty clothes thrown everywhere, piles of crap all over, sticky floors, dog poop left on the floor but the nastiest part was the bathrooms. She said they wouldn't empty their bathroom trashes and the ladies of the house would throw their used tampons on top of overflowing trash so she had to pick up their used women's products thrown on the floor not even wrapped in paper. So these fancy bitches would walk around the club like they were so superior and look down on everyone then would go home and act like wild apes throwing their trash and period products on the ground. The thought of being so out of touch that you decide it is beneath you to even be sanitary BC you can just pay someone to do that for you is just beyond insanity. If you're that rich and you're paying people to come clean for you, why not pay them to come every day? Seriously, wealthy people often literally have live-in staff. These guys are either mentally ill or not as rich as they pretend to be. Had a client come into our 3D printing office. His attention was immediately caught by a large industrial 3D printer in our showroom. Pulled out a credit card and bought a $250,000 machine on the spot. Best part was when we installed the machine at his facility. First thing he wanted to print was a meter tall penis. Few weeks after the install we got a photo of him standing next to the meter penis. Money well spent. First thing I printed with my ender was a penis. To this day, nothing I've printed has come out as clean, though I'm admittedly not great at it. My favorite print so far was a birthday gift for a friend. I combined a vintage Garfield statue with a fat hog. It was a big veiny triumph bastard. Worked as one of four full-time groundskeepers at a large estate. 46 acres of lawn to mow twice a week, two clay tennis courts, three pools, one for the main house and one for each of the two guest houses, 100 plus acre private lake with boat house, no clue how big the whole estate was including the woods, personal favorite was the three mile personal race track, but what really blew my mind was that he hosted his niece's wedding one summer, paid $350,000 to have this massive willow tree trucked in and planted by the lake for wedding photos, only to pay another $50,000 to have it removed and the landscaping returned to its original state after the wedding because he did not like the look of it. I've always wondered, can you actually move and resoil massive mature trees? Like if you see a gorgeous massive tree on a hill somewhere and you're thinking man, I wish I'd have this tree in my backyard, does it mean you can actually do it? Take it out with roots and all and replant it somewhere else? Google Tree Spade. It's a big piece of machinery that's explicitly for the purpose of digging up large trees. There are small ones you can operate with a skid steer, but the biggest ones can transplant truly massive trees. Here's an example, https colon slash slash www.treemindustries.ca slash Canada's biggest tree spade. My sister is a butler for a super wealthy family she told me a couple crazy stories. The family once got this super expensive rare breed cat and a few months later the wife tells my sister she can feel the cat isn't quite happy in their house so she asks her to take their private jet to drop the cat off in their mansion on Lake Como, Italy so it could spend a holiday in the sun.
That same woman would then sometimes berate my sister for buying soap in plastic dispensers instead of just soap bars because it's bad for our planet they bought this insanely huge super luxurious cabin in one of the most expensive ski stations in Switzerland. They realized the cabin, more like a mansion really, right next to theirs was for sale and then bought that one as well just so they wouldn't have close neighbors. I thought our cats were spoiled, but now that they've heard the private jet and mansion on Lake Como story I'm on probation. Clearly I've been slacking off on providing accommodations befitting their status. You get pushed into 2030 for 10 minutes and you get one Google search. What you looking for? Reddit, you go back in time to 2023. What would you do? Oops. You're out of free Reddit articles for this year. Click here to upgrade to Reddit Blue to access this content. 2026 Musk Social Media. Reddit Orange. 2024 March Madness Bracket. Warren Buffet has a standing $1 billion offer to whoever gets a perfect bracket. Maybe Warren Buffett wants to trap a time traveler. $1 billion is a small price to pay to imprison a time traveler and learn his secrets of time travel. Lottery numbers 2023. Or highest growth stocks from 2023 to 2030. That requires a lot of capital now though. Edit. Okay little WSB gremlins I understand options. I don't need another 50 replies about them. Big oily tits. Some things don't change regardless of time you bud. I recall being a young lad in the early 90s, sitting around with my friends talking about what we would wish for if we happened upon a magic genie that could grant us three wishes. We unanimously all agreed that we'd wish to see some big oily tits. Things definitely do not change. Biggest lottery winners 2023 and the numbers for the drawing just before them. This is the one. Now you're not splitting the big pot with anybody. You could always buy 100,000 tickets with the same number, and then they only get one 100,000th of the share while you get the rest. Imagine winning first division in a $100 million lottery, and finding out you get $1,000, because you have to share it with some bloke that fucked the system. I'm sure they'd investigate it, and you'd be denied the money because the odds of you doing that by chance versus the odds of you doing that by cheating are insurmountable. Am I pregnant? How to know if pregante. 38 plus 2 weeks pre -gananant? Looking up obituaries for terrible public figures, CEOs, politicians, hate group leaders, etc. Then upon return anonymously creating a widely announced death note scenario where one of the tracked individuals has their death announced a day in advance for their heinous behavior. At first it's a hoax, a joke, or several lucky guesses, but after enough accurate predictions the doubt begins to creep in. The influential sleazes of the world begin to clean up their acts due to a quasi-mystical, unavoidable, and all-knowing threat of imminent doom. Damn I'd watch this movie. I mean, watch Death Note, close enough. The history of the 2020s. Imagine you spend 8 minutes on the COVID articles. Seriously, COVID 2027 sucked. The winners of the next seven Super Bowls, and Baseball World Series. Gonna go Biff Tannen. Just make sure you don't bet so high that it makes the news. The moment anything about your gambling based on this information is brought to the awareness of the player slash ref slash execs, you risk a butterfly effect. Imagine walking into the Super Bowl locker room before the game and hearing some random guy just bet his entire net worth on us losing. You don't really need to put that much down to win a lot if you know the Super Bowl winner, you can gamble at the beginning of the season and make huge returns on your initial bet. How do I use the shells? He he he, he doesn't know how to use the three seashells. Ha 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 ha. Ha 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 um but fr wears all the toilet paper. Has George R. R. Martin finished the series? Greater than George R. R. Martin, age 81, recently announced that the winds of winter is nearly complete and that he expects to be done by mid-2031 at the latest. Mr. Martin stated that he is at least 70% done and he just needs to work out a few details. Not sure if it was a joke article or not, but I remember seeing George R. R. Martin said he isn't having the book released until after he dies, so he won't have to see the fans complaining about it. 10 minutes for one Google search. I will search why the internet is so slow. 404. Cannot be found. That's eerily unsettling. GTA 6 release date. Geometry-2.2 release date. No results have been found. Except for more Mr. Boss to clickbait, of course. 
10 minutes is a long time. I may only get one Google search, but I'll duck duck go the shit out the rest of that time. Same lol my first thing would be downloading an ad blocker. Authorities have been alerted. Please remain still and drink a verification can. I'd look up winning horse races slash gambling winning numbers throughout the years 2023 to 2030. Back to the future style. There's already a computer system that earned a group billions betting on horse races in East Asia. We've always been at betting odds with East Asia. Chords for Wonderwall. Today is gonna be the day. Best performing stocks 2024. You don't even need the best performing stocks. Just give me 6 years of any asset, from BTC to Dow Jones Industrial Average. I have 10 minutes to remember buy and sell dates for that asset. This. I don't really speculate in crypto personally but if I had 6 and a half years of advanced knowledge I'd chose BTC or ETH due to their volatility and just memorize their buy slash sell dates. Then just try to get as much leverage as possible when I get back and time it perfectly for the rest of the decade. Probably look for my obituary. If I die of cancer then I will know to keep a lookout get an early start on that shit. Catching it early is half the battle. Reported missing in 2023. The body was never found. Goddamn, imagining how creepy that'd feel to read about yourself. Imagine also that the article mentions the primary suspect the police could never gather enough evidence on was a good friend or your friendly neighbor. The same person you were in the company of before you suddenly got sent forward in time. What happened to Tyler the Creator? He got really into fashion. The end. It's 2030. He's now into floral arrangements. The beginning. Sports Almanac 2020 to 2030. Now make a like a tree and get out of here. You're about as funny as a screen door on a battleship. Did the Lions win a Super Bowl in the last 10 years? Two guys from Detroit are driving on the lodge, slip on black ice, and die. They go straight to hell. Satan decides to pay them a visit. He goes to the Detroiter's place and sees that they're having a great time in their new home. He says guys, this is hell, you're not supposed to enjoy it. They tell him well it's so cold in Detroit we're just enjoying the heat. Satan, furious, goes to the boiler room and turns the heat up. On his way back to the Detroiter's room the other souls are begging him to turn it back down. Upon arriving he notices that they are laughing over a barbecue. Seriously? Says the devil. It's several hundred degrees and you're out here making hot dogs? Well the weather is just so nice we couldn't skip a chance to get the grill out. They tell him. Satan is pissed. He goes to the boiler room and shuts it off. He turns on the AC. Hell becomes colder than it's ever been recorded on earth. He goes back to the Detroiter's place and sees that they're crowded around a TV throwing a party. What in hell are you doing? You're not supposed to enjoy this. What do you have to celebrate about? Says Satan. The two Detroiters look at him and say well we figured hell froze over so the lions must have won. Alternatively, the potholes must be all fixed. What is the price of Bitcoin? Chart of Bitcoin price in US dollars 2023 to 2030 fixed. Russian-Ukrainian war consequences. Vladimir Putin wins posthumous Nobel Peace Prize for ending the war by poisoning himself with cyanide, shooting himself three times, wrapping himself in a carpet, and jumping into the Malaya Nevka River. Oh, those Russians. Nasty sluts. Hey yo what if your girlfriend pops up? All the better. Best investment the last decade. Sounds like an easy way to get a bunch of random get rich quick schemes. Big tits near me plus granny plus Fortnite plus Burger King. I'd definitely go inside that store. Find out the best rated movie, write down the plot and claim copyright when it comes out. Copy paste the entire transcript of the highest grossing film of the mid late 2020s and publish it onto some obscure but datable corner of the internet, in your name of course, as well as make it your copyrighted work. About a month after the the movie releases, email the movie studio's law firm. Instant multi-multi-million out of court cash settlement. Jokes on you. The script was written 15 years ago and shelved until the technology was invented to film it. Your suit is dismissed as clearly you copied their script, not the other way around. I'd probably search to see if Krava disease has a cure yet. My son was diagnosed in April, and the least month and a half has been a whirlwind of getting him a stem cell transplant to prolong his life, since without it, 
the doctors projected he would pass away by the end of the year. It would be nice to see if in seven years a cure has been found. I don't really care about much else at this point. I'm so sorry really do hope for a miracle, that your son is okay soon. Try and figure out what public companies grew the most in the last five years, and invest in those when I get back. Nah. Only really tiny companies can grow by orders of magnitude and that's what you need to change your life by investing. But investing significant amounts of money would change their course, so it doesn't work out. Lottery numbers it is. Medical professionals of Reddit, have you ever had a patient so lacking in common sense you wondered how they made it this far? If so, what is your story? Rural ER doc here. 35-year-old female walks in with right-sided jaw slash neck swelling. I think it happened because I ate some meat yesterday that my body is reacting to. 10 minutes later, oh yeah, and I accidentally swallowed a bee and it stung me in my mouth right before this happened. Sorry I forgot to mention that. A friend of my mother's died from a wasp that got into his drink. He swallowed it, it stung him on its way down, and despite having no allergy to stings, the swelling was enough to close off his airway. Okay, new fear unlocked. I am already paranoid about bugs going into a drink can and I won't drink anything I left unattended a while, but that. That's just awful. Edit, tons of replies. Just want to say I'm even more horrified now. This is not as rare as I thought. Not me but my wife who is a vet, had a client who got mad at her because he didn't realize that once he neutered his dog that he wouldn't be able to breed it. As someone who worked at a vet office I am completely unsurprised. We once had to explain what smegma was to very embarrassed owners of a new puppy who brought him in for discharge around his penis. Not to mention the countless people who bring their cats and asking about a lump only to be told it's a nipple. And then you occasionally get the inevitable but he's a boy. And have to explain that male mammals have nipples too. Like ma'am you are married. Have you never noticed your husband has nipples before? I miss working there. I'm just happy these people bring their pets in for medical care, even if it was nothing. Better than the opposite, which I think there are more of. Had an adult male patient who needed a Foley catheter. His mother was in the room, and they both lived together in the backwoods of TN. I informed them both of the order for a catheter, how it works, and why it was needed. His mother stated well he's still a virgin and I'm not sure I'm comfortable with his virginity being taken in a hospital. I hope that was just a joke. Hell, I'd tell that joke. I wish it was had to have a delicate conversation with this woman to explain that I was not taking her son's virginity. Not me but my mother would pick up shifts as a nurse sometimes in labor and delivery and she had met a handful of women who didn't know the baby was going to be coming out of their vaginas. Like no clue. My mom usually said something like how you got it in is how it's coming out honey. This was the late 90 early 2000s. I'm a social worker and one of my clients literally kept getting pregnant over and over after having kids. And I had a frank conversation with her about birth control or getting her tubes tied because she kept going through horrific births only to get her kids taken away. And she actually said to me that she didn't know that birth control or safe sex would save her from getting pregnant. She didn't realize that sex equals pregnant because she was sexually abused as a child and her father told her that she could only get pregnant when she's in love. And she had never been in love. So she didn't understand why she kept getting pregnant. Sex was only pleasure for her. So she didn't realize that was what was having her get pregnant. Edit. Typo. God. That's awful. That poor woman. Had an 18 or 19 year old girl come in my ER with some complaint that required an x-ray. It's standard that we do a urine pregnancy test prior to imaging on any female of childbearing years. She insisted she'd never had sex and there was zero possibility of pregnancy. We did the test anyway and it resulted that she was pregnant. We did a blood pregnancy test to confirm the result, since she insisted she couldn't possibly be pregnant because she'd never had sex. That was positive too. We gave her a few minutes to herself to figure out what the hell happened. And when I returned to check on her a short time later she asked me if she could get pregnant even though her boyfriend, didn't go all the way in. She 100% believed that long as his penis wasn't entirely in her it didn't count as sex. It took nearly a half hour of explaining reproduction to her for her to understand that whether it's halfway in or all the way in sperm travel. What do you call guys that use the pull-out method of birth control? Fathers. 73 here, former clinical microbiologist, long ago. Still. I found myself all over the clinical lab at times, not just infectious disease. So, one day, this 20-something guy, wife and mom in tow, walks in with a paper request for semen analysis, pre-computer era. Okay, not the most comfortable encounter, but I'm a professional and did this drill many times. He had not been briefed by the doc and had no idea how establishing infertility in males was done. Well, okay, a challenge, 
Then, I took him aside and, using standard medical terminology told him how a diagnosis is made and what he needed to do to provide a specimen. He couldn't slash wouldn't believe that I was asking him to masturbate into that container, astonished. Then he played dumb, as if the word was unfamiliar to him. We looped through the medical terms and procedure again, and I eventually resorted to every word I knew to describe the act. It was like a George Carlin bit. A half hour later, he emerged from the toilet with two inches of urine in the cup. God almighty. The report went back patient provided improper specimen. Greater than he had not been briefed by the doc and had no idea how establishing infertility in males was done. From personal experience, the doc probably did explain the process in excruciating detail and then the guy peed in the toilet to practice. Wanna bet that the reason this dude was having fertility problems was because he was giving his wife the wrong sample? Not a personal experience, but one from a colleague of mine, I only saw the pics. So this 60-something-year-old suffers from an acute complication and gets a pacemaker to solve the problem. Everything goes normally and as planned, he recovers, every care and meds that he needs to take are prescribed, explained and medical appointments with a cardiologist slash arrhythmologist are scheduled so that he may get the follow-up he needs. The man then proceeds to never show up to any appointment and never ends where any calls from the hospital to know of him and reschedule. This went on for around three years, until he shows up without former warning and asks to talk with the doctor that did the procedure to put his pacemaker. People are weirded out, but seeing that on that day the doctor was present and this patient was in clear distress, they talk to him and manage a couple of minutes to have the doctor check on him. Inside the appointment room, the doctor takes notice that this man is wearing a bra inside a shirt. The man explains he has been wearing his daughter's bra for three months after his problem got worse. The shirt is asked to be taken off and there he stands, the shirtless man wearing his daughter's bra, showing off the pacemaker, that should have been kept inside his body, dangling outside of it, being held by the left bra cup, with a big infected open wound above it with the pacemaker lead still inserted onto his veins and connected to his heart. Nobody has any idea how the man let that situation come to be or how he didn't die of sepsis or any other health problem that may appear for that matter. But TLDR, man gets a pacemaker, doesn't show up to appointments, three years later comes to the hospital looking for help, wearing his daughter's bra for three months, to serve as a holder for the pacemaker that got out of his body from his infected open wound. It is insane how sometimes people die because of a single knock to a certain part of their skull and then other people will have an infected open wound leading to their goddamn heart and only get concerned after a few months. Hey yeah doc I'm carrying all my organs around in these buckets, do you have anything for when my hands get tired? I'm a pharmacist. One evening shift I was working a relief shift, not my usual pharmacy. A man comes in looking distressed. Man, I had sexual relations with a woman I do not intend to pursue a long-term relationship with. Yes. He said it just like that. Me. Okay, I'm assuming there was an accident or it was unprotected. How long ago did it happen? Man, last night, at 7 p.m. on the couch. Whoa TMI, I just need to know approximate time to know if Plan B will work oh oh. Me, we have this medication called Plan B, and since the incident happened within 72 hours. Man, oh yes, I got that for her already yesterday right after we finished. We want to know if there is anything we can do to know if she is pregnant now. Me, unfortunately not. She'll have to wait three weeks or so to see if she gets her period, and if she doesn't then she can do a pregnancy test then. Theoretically you could do a blood test for faster results, but that would also not be until a couple of weeks, at least. Man, we're just really anxious because she really doesn't want to be pregnant. Is there anything that she can take to prevent the pregnancy? Any multivitamin? Minerals? Food? Me, she's already taken it, which was the plan B there are some other options but those are prescriptions. And no, there are no over-the-counter products she can take. Man. What about me? Is there anything I can take now to prevent the pregnancy? Any multivitamins or minerals? Me colon dot 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 no sir. There isn't anything you can take now. He just needs to disconnect the Bluetooth between his balls and the swimmers. Working midnight in the ER. Family brings in a four-year-old at two Amish. I ask them what is wrong. Them, ask him, the four-year-old. He said he needed to see a doctor. Me, did he say anything was wrong? Them, no. He said he needed to see a doctor, so brought him. A quick back and forth that firmly establishes that they actually showed up in the ER at 2 a.m., purely because the four-year-old said he needed to see a doctor and they don't know why. Meet a child, why do you need to see a doctor? Kid, the doctor has suckers. Me, to be clear, it is the parents who lack sense and not the kid. The kid is smart. All I have to do is say I don't feel well and they take me somewhere to get a sucker. 
Downside is the next time the kid actually needs a doctor they will probably ignore him. Paramedic, elderly woman complains that her mouth is dry and she felt a bit dizzy climbing the stairs earlier. Go through the whole rigmarole of getting a medical history, vitals, more detail on symptoms. Ask her what she's had to drink today. A cup of tea, 10 hours ago. Any water? No. Guess what fixed it within 5 minutes. My mom has given up on trying to get my dad to drink water during the day. All he drinks is coffee and beer, and there's water in those. He takes his meds with Guinness. His exercise consists of going from the bed to the couch and back again each day. He'll go grocery shopping and to the variety store, but he doesn't go out often. Doesn't do much housework or outdoor work. Then he wonders why he's having trouble regulating his blood sugar. But he's not someone you can reason with. In this lady's case, maybe she genuinely forgot or had trouble recognizing symptoms of thirst? I've heard of that happening. Ed, a word. Wedding photographers of Reddit, what was your they're not gonna last long moment? Said this before. Third wedding and the best man, the groom's brother, starts his speech. Well, welcome back everyone. Good to see some new faces and some old ones. At his third wedding, my uncle's best man started his speech with, I told you buying my suit would be cheaper than renting. He got his third divorce after about six months, which to be honest was longer than we expected because we all saw it coming like the steamroller security guard from Austin Powers. Greater than like the steamroller security guard from Austin Powers. Great reference. I haven't seen that movie in years but as soon as I read this I could picture his face. When I worked as a wedding planner for a hotel chain, the groom had found out his bride was having an affair with her brother's best mate. The bride's mother knew about it, but insisted on the wedding and paid a fortune. The groom wasn't drinking much and at the speeches, stood up and revealed he knew and said he was getting an annulment. He then took his best man on his honeymoon. The honeymoon the bride's parents had paid for. It's not gay if you make the ex-mother-in-law pay. If it rhymes it's true. When the groom looked at her like she was the love of his life, and she treated the day like her prom and ignored him. I think they lasted six months. This was my wedding frown he ignored me most of the reception and I had to drag him onto the dance floor, but even then he only gave me a single song. I kept going around the wedding looking for him, and when I'd find him he'd be in the middle of a conversation and I'd have to just stand quietly behind him because he wouldn't fill me in on what they were talking about. At the end of the wedding, we had a send-off moment where everyone made an arm tunnel for us and cheered us on our way to the elevator. It was cute, but I felt his hand slip out of mine and I turned around at the door to the elevator to see that he'd stopped a few feet back to talk to his friend some more. I looped my arm through his, yet again he didn't include me in their conversation, and stood there awkwardly rubbing his arm to try to get his attention. When I finally managed to get his attention, I think I cracked a joke to the whole group about we have to go consummate the marriage or it isn't legal, see y'all at the after party. He raised his voice at me, saying that I was tearing him away from his friends. He had spent all day and night with his friends. I just wanted to take a turn. It was the most pathetic version of myself I've ever been. We lasted four years. I hope you're in a much better and happier place now. Went to a wedding during college to my friends that got married who graduated two years prior to me. They had a beautiful wedding on a boat off the Keys and as the best man gave his speech, he was really drunk by this point, just shouted out, you don't deserve her, you literally got a blow job from a stripper no make that two strippers at your bachelor party. Peace out. He dropped the mic and tried to do a dramatic exit but by this point we were all stuck on this boat in the middle of the ocean. It took an hour to get back to port and it was the most awful and awkward hour of our lives for everyone on that boat. Do go on. What did I miss? Bride was such a monumental bitch her mom gave me a $500 tip for not walking out on the event when she was treating everyone, even her now husband, like a piece of shit employee. She did the whole clicking fingers thing when wanting someone to do something for her, and she berated the DJ for grabbing a sandwich when he'd been there for about 8 hours and was told that he should have brought his own lunch and she would be taking the cost of the food, like an open buffet style, out of his paycheck. They were divorced within 3 years, but not before having 3 kids that have stupid names. Greater than having 3 kids that have stupid names. Dear Hunter, go tell Jaden and Bronxana that dinner's gonna get cold. I'm pregnant with our first and I'm now adding Dear Hunter to my list of name proposals. Not only does this add weight to the names I want my partner to lean towards but also it will make him laugh. Ooh ooh finally one of these I can contribute to. My mother was a wedding photographer till I was about 18 to 19 and I helped out on many of them. The one that stands out the most was when we were at a campsite where both the wedding and reception were being held. About halfway through the reception I hear the groom start laughing maniacally. I peeked over his way and could see two groomsmen hauling the thrashing and screaming bride towards the lake. 
they threw her into the freezing cold water with her veil and dress still on, when she got out of the water I genuinely thought she might shoot somebody, saying she looked like a drowned rat would have been an insult to rats, her hair and makeup and probably the dress were ruined beyond repair, the fact that the groom laughed and didn't do anything stuck with me as being a dog shit move even as a teen, apparently she thought so too because irk they didn't even make it 6 months, that's one of the most horrible wedding stories I have ever heard in my life, not just because they threw her in the lake, but also because depending on the weight of the dress, the cuts of fabric, and the depth of the lake, she could have easily drowned. I was thinking this, I helped my wife out of her dress once the night was over and was surprised with just how heavy that thing was, it would have been insanely heavy when wet, I can only imagine that the reason she walked out was due to the complete rage fueling her. Bride looked visibly miserable the entire ceremony, while photographing the men's getting ready portion. The groom repeatedly kept joking about killing himself. During the toast, the bride ran off to the bathroom for about 30 minutes and came back wiping her tears with her eyes red and puffy. Neither of them had any chemistry at all, it made no sense why they were together to me. That was the last wedding I shot. Was it an arranged marriage? That or a shotgun wedding? Oh man, I was a wedding photographer for about 5 years. I get being awkward on camera and not wanting to do any public PDA. I'm very awkward myself, but when prompting couples for fun poses like whispering obscenities in each other's ear for a laughing shot, nuzzling close together, etc., most couples eventually let their guard down and enjoyed holding each other. It was so sweet. A few times though, I had couples that visibly didn't want to be near each other at all. Once the shot was done, they went back to standing a foot apart. They would complain about each other and make fun of each other in front of me. It always left me with a bad feeling in my gut, and most of the time the marriage didn't last long shooting the groom pre-ceremony, he gets a phone call. She did what? Pained expression, with a bit of a lip snarl and head shake. Tone of sad resignation. Well did anyone call Susan? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Long pause while the other person talks. I'm sorry. No, I can't say anything like that to her today. No idea what it was about, but he looked like he had a mix of this as my life now and contempt. They lasted a few weeks and after splitting agreed to split all the remaining wedding bills. He paid his half then found out a year later that she never paid her half and sent me the rest. I sent it back and told him he'd already paid enough for that mistake. We still have a beer or round of golf every year or so, 20 years later. Good dude, bad judge of women. After 20 years, you've never asked him about that phone call and he never mentioned what it was about? I think my first clue was when the bride showed up with some bad makeup clearly trying to cover her black eye while most of the rest of the family seemed far more into the free food and booze than the wedding itself. Oh yeah, never paid me either. Classy people. Yikes. Any idea if she ever got out of that marriage? Not really. It was a small town slash rural area and this was pretty much the norm. Groom didn't want to participate in any wedding pictures after the ceremony. I believe he was more interested in drinking beers with his buddies. I don't think they lasted a year. I went to a weird wedding like this. It was my wife's high school best friend's wedding. My wife's friend in my opinion is a wonderful person, very caring and smart but suffers from a bad inferiority complex. She did the online dating thing for a while and dated this stereotypical rich dude from a waspy family. He was a corporate lawyer. Absolutely did not mesh personality wise with her. Forgot to mention my wife's friend also came from a very well off family. But she never flaunted it or fit any of the stereotypes of a rich person. So they end up getting engaged and every time we hung out as a group, I would struggle to find topics to talk with a guy about because all the wanted to discuss was baseball and the stock markets, two topics I couldn't care less about. So at the wedding which was held at this very fancy venue in our city, they did the obligatory religious ceremony, walked around together and thanked people. But once the reception was going on, the groom literally hung out with his frat brothers the whole time. My wife's friend pretty much stayed glued to my wife and her other friends and they danced all night. The only time the groom peeled away was to do the first dance thing together and then he literally went back to broing it up with his friends. I even pointed the out to my wife during the reception and my wife tried to steer her friend to her friend's now husband. But he would see them approaching and yell out he needed to grab some drinks for the guys and disappeared. This is the worst part. At the end of the wedding, the expectation is they would leave together, right? Nope. The groom said he and the guys were going to go out around town so he could say a final goodbye and he will meet his wife at the hotel later. I was fucking blown away at what a horrible fucking match he was. Was this an NC? I swear we may have been at the same wedding. If not it's sad how scary similar this story is. The worst part was at the end of the reception the bride was going around asking everyone have you seen my husband? And nobody had a clue where he went. While shooting video, 
I attached the microphone to the groom for audio and proceeded to prepare for the ceremony. Just as I was about to adjust my audio settings, the groom stepped into another room with a friend. As I put on my headphones, I overheard the groom confiding in his friend, describing the wedding as a wedding of convenience and reassuring them not to be concerned about what would happen in their relationship. I know two people who had a wedding of convenience. He's gay, she's a lesbian. Their parents are Chinese, immigrants to the USA on one side, still in China on the other. They have a marriage that makes their parents happy, they're really good friends slash roommates, and they do what they want on the side. It works, but the logistics must be intense. I mean it's pretty much the same as having a roommate right but better. In another life, I worked catering shifts, loads of Saturday weddings. I'll never forget the best man's toast of the groom. It was a shameless roast. He spoke openly about the groom's willingness to shag anything when he's drunk. He then went on and on about the groom's deadly gambling habit and his short fuse when he doesn't win. He asked the stone-faced groom how many thousands of dollars in golf clubs have you destroyed or lost in countless ponds? Nobody was laughing. The bride had tears in her eyes and the groom's parents sat in stunned silence. What's the most disturbing piece of audio there is? Jim Jones talking into a microphone while his followers poison their children. This was the one that came to mind for me, forcing those kids to take poison. They had many of the children poisoned before the mothers so the mothers will would more willing to drink. Truly sickening. The 911 call of the woman whose chimp was eating her friend's face. Why do people have primates as pets? They do not make good pets. Can y'all stop replying you're all saying the same three things. Hey my toddler makes a great pet. The 911 call of the lady stuck in her car in a flood and the operator is so unhelpful, she ends up drowning on the other end of the phone. If it's the same incident I'm thinking of, that happened near where I used to live. That 911 operator was not only unhelpful, she took her damn time sending anyone out to help the driver, and instead of being fired or charged with anything, she was allowed to retire and the county just kind of hand waved it away, saying there was nothing they could do because she'd already retired. Removed. This one is accompanied by video, but the reaction of a man whose wife gets killed when a brick flies off the back of a truck they were driving behind on a highway and came through their windshield. The audio was captured by their dash cam, one of those things you can't unhear. Yeah this one is just straight depressing, extreme raw emotion of a sudden and violent loss of life, I can't even begin to imagine how traumatizing that is. I used to work at a hospital and I can never get the sounds of unbridled animalistic wailing out of my head. There's no sound like the sound of somebody's heart and soul shredded to pieces when they've lost their center. I still haven't heard this video and I don't want to because I still can't get the sounds of mothers screaming for their child or a husband for his dead wife out of my head. The 911 call of Loretta Picard, a disabled elderly woman who died in a house fire. She was physically unable to get out of the house on her own. There were firefighters outside her house, but due to a miscommunication, they thought the house was empty. On the call, you hear the woman talking as the fire gets worse and she gets closer to death. Everyone jumps on the dispatcher whenever this story is brought up on Reddit, but even if she had taken that call flawlessly Loretta would still have died in that fire. It was the fire department, not the dispatcher, that killed her. Yes, it took the dispatcher two minutes to figure out that Loretta was disabled and trapped in the fire. And yes, that is ridiculous. However, by the time she managed to put it all together, the FD was still a long way off from arriving at the scene. The FD had been told repeatedly before they arrived that there was someone trapped inside. They were then told repeatedly after they arrived that someone was trapped inside. However, they decided to treat it as a standard unoccupied structure fire. So, the first team to arrive called for another truck because they were implementing the two-in slash two-out rule, which is basically a buddy system from OSHA that requires a minimum of four people to attack a fire from inside of a building. However, they weren't attacking a fire. They were there to rescue someone. And the two-in slash two-out rule does not apply in that situation. Moreover, their own department policy covering the situation they found themselves in required them to make entry and attempt a rescue. The FD's battalion chief, who would arrive later but was in radio contact the entire time, also never corrected the two-in slash two-out call. What he did though was lie to the media about the FD attempting entry and having two firefighters being injured in the process. Two things that never happened, at least while Loretta was still alive. And it's worth noting that Loretta was on the phone with 911 for 20 minutes. The fire department was on scene for five of those minutes. She knew they were outside. She died knowing that they were doing nothing to help her. I'm a fireman. Besides minor things I'd say you're correct. That's why being an aggressive department is key. My department searches every single structure for life.
we make interior attacks before we have two and two out every time we go in. Barring the structure having fire out of every opening or some sort of major structural collapse we enter every structure and try to put it out from the inside because that's what saves lives. That 911 call from the guy trapped in one of the twin towers. I'll never forget that audio, the guy saying in a panic lady, we're not ready to die but it's getting bad than a short while later you hear the floors above coming down he screams oh god no then silence. My only hope is for those that did perish that it was quick and they felt no pain. Absolutely horrific. Edit, the gentleman's name was Kevin Cosgrove, thank you kind Redditor. I have a family member that was a firefighter for 9-11. He was in one of later trucks because he had to come from the other side of the city. I'll never forget when he told me. The armada I was part of was relatively late to the scene. When we got there, the first tower was gone and the second was, even though we didn't know it at the time, was only a few minutes from coming down. We drove directly beside the second tower and the road got real bumpy. My chief told us newer guys to not look out the windows. Exiting the truck at our designated parking spot, I realized it was body parts we'd been driving over. Apparently people had given up and jumped from a height that made their body explode slash tear apart on impact with the road. I'd venture that the toolbox killer's audio recording of them torturing and raping Shirley Ledford is probably pretty high up on the list. It has never been released to the public, or leaked, but there does exist the full transcript online. Forensic therapist here, to anyone who is morbidly curious about this sort of thing or how bad could it be? Please understand that even reading the transcript can trigger PTSD, OCD, or panic attacks. It is not worth IT. There is no upside to knowing, I assure you. You will not have your curiosity sated, you'll just feel sick and broken, even for those WHO have seen IT all online. If you have kids and read IT you're a fucking idiot, and that's my professional opinion. It takes a certain type of person, trained over many years to specifically hear slash watch these things and manage their emotions to even analyze this data, and even among the specialists, PTSD is common. Suicide among people who deal with the worst of it is also well documented. Edit, to all the edgelords messaging me telling me how I convince them to read it by warning them not to. I don't give a fuck what you do. The warning gives a chance to others to leave well enough alone and protect their mental health. I wish this was at the top of every post like this. I've been legitimately disturbed by so many rabbit holes I've gone down on what began as an innocent 10 minutes on Reddit. There is no benefit. You're absolutely right. I wish I could unread slash unhear slash unsee a lot of terrible things I've come across so easily and unintentionally online. Jared from Subway talking about how he likes kids who come from bad homes because they are easier to manipulate into having sex. Don't 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 listen to it. I just watched that on Dr. Phil and couldn't believe they actually played it for people to listen to, truly sickening. Dr. Phil is a ratings and money whore. Did you really think he would take the high road and not play it? The woman who helped build the case against Jared from Subway by recording him talking about his enjoyment of pedophilia. Listening to a couple minutes of him describing what he's done made me want to vomit. The process of getting this stuff on tape wrecked the woman's mental health, and it's easy to see why. That documentary was tough to get through. That woman proves how unstoppable a mom protecting children can be. Absolutely disgusting things, and she pushed through to help get the arrest made. True hero. And then on the other side is the two girls' mother, that sold out her daughter's privacy so that she could blow horses for the pleasure of other men. The weepy-voiced killer. He killed women, completely mutilated them and proceeded to call the police while crying about what happened and how he can't stop himself. Then he'd hang up and do it again. Did they catch him? Deleted. The 911 call from one of the teachers present at the Columbine school shooting. You can hear the gunshots and the gunmen cheering and whooping. You also hear when they enter the library, which is where they killed the most students. It's chilling. My high school girlfriend's sister was a student at Columbine at the time. She survived simply because another person died very close to her and the gunman thought he got them both. Her stories were beyond description of sadness and agony. She is mostly okay today, from what I understand, but it took a long time to get there. I'm related by marriage to a survivor. She knew the shooters very well. She was in the library that day. She survived only because she had been nice to them. They told her so as they killed the girl next to her. Survivor's guilt is real, and can be devastating. The 911 call from the attack of Travis the chimpanzee. Travis screams can be heard in the background at the start of the tape as Harold owner of Travis, pleads for the police, who initially believed the call to be a hoax until she said, he's eating her. Remind me of a news story I had read. A teen went camping with her father, or stepfather, and they were attacked by a bear and her cubs. 
The bear left and came back while the teen was on the phone with her mom. The teen at one point said, Mom, they're eating me. I cannot imagine how awful that must have been. Yeah, wasn't this in Russia? She made multiple calls and the last one was telling her mom she doesn't feel any pain anymore. The cult leader from the documentary Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey where he records his rape of a young girl in his secret room in which only the most devout followers are allowed. It's haunting. Well, I'm taking this out of my Netflix queue. I want to clarify, they do not play the whole thing. They only play a piece leading up to the rape. You do not have to hear that. But what they do play is still sickening. The Apollo 1 crew. Those guys were the coolest, calmest, most extensively well-trained former combat-slash-test fighter pilots in the world and all they could do was scream. That audio kept me up the night I heard it the first time. I worked at the National Archives long ago and had access to the transcript predictably mostly screaming. Irk the document itself had an attachment saying the audio had been destroyed out of respect for the families. Though I had some doubt of that, only today, 20 odd years later, learning that wasn't true. I'm sure others have mentioned it, but one that really, truly upset me was when a poor delivery lady had mistakenly driven into flood waters. She called 911 and the dispatcher was cruel beyond words. I'll never forget it. If it came out that we were 100% living in a simulation, what would be the biggest indicator looking back? How arbitrary the speed of light limit is. It's just the read slash write speed limit of the hard drive we are living in. Junior simulation dev, hey, should we model the whole multiverse? Senior simulation dev, nah, just make a skydome texture. Junior simulation dev, what do we do if they make it to the edge? Senior simulation dev, just cap their travel speed, by the time they get there it will be somebody else's problem. Not only did they cap the travel speed, they also introduced the arbitrary variant of universe expansion to never really have to render anything beyond the local cluster. It's a neat trick, though, much better than the invisible wall all around that we use in our simulations. All the deja vu moments. Like MF I've played this level already. There are moments where I've gone wow I feel like I've seen this place in a dream or wow this happened in a dream and I don't know how to react. I once had a dream about driving through this one specific intersection in the mountains. Keep in mind, I was only like 9, and I'd never seen mountains before, let alone this specific spot. About half a year later, my family went on a road trip, and we drove through that intersection that I'd dreamt of. I also have similar stories of the same thing happening, and it happens probably at least 3 times a year. Our Sims can play The Sims. I wonder if our Sims Sims are playing The Sims. I like to think they are. Those Sims deserve to enjoy The Sims as much as our Sims. The Bader Meinhof phenomenon lazy coding like GTA, you see a car for the first time and the next day you see it everywhere. I recently learned while watching a speed run that this wasn't lazy coding, it was a hardware limitation. The old games could only keep so many different models of car loaded at once, so whatever car you were driving would become more frequent since it had to be loaded. Even GTA 5 has this. It's basically laid out in the wiki that all vehicles will have specific spawn points, and when you're driving a particular vehicle, certain vehicles will spawn around you. This is particular if you're looking for, say, a specific sports car that you want to cruise around in. That it never fails that once you start to get a little bit ahead in life, your car's check engine light comes on. It actually happened to me a year ago. Haven't heard about this before though. Happened to me last month, Though the check engine light is sometimes metaphorical. Wife and I were able to completely be out of debt, with exception of our house note, then the water heater went out. Long, but super weird and inexplicable. I know how this sounds, but I swear this really happened. I was a childhood bookworm, while the other girls at a fifth grade sleepover were playing air hockey and dancing around to let's hear it for the boy. I'd pulled a creepy looking book off my hostess shelf and huddled into a beanbag chair in a quiet corner of her family room. I finished the book that night and the next morning I placed it back on her shelf, left, and promptly forgot the title. We moved a few months later and I spent the next 7 years trying to find that damn book. There was no internet, just old card catalogs, but I searched every library I visited. Unfortunately, both book and title remained elusive. It turns out that there is no shortage of books about young ghost girls on farms and spooky houses with ponds. The author wasn't Mary Downing Hahn, Richard Peck, or any of the usual paranormal authors. It wasn't wait till Helen comes. The only thing I could remember about the cover was that she was holding an owl. That didn't turn out to be helpful, either. In my sophomore year I worked as a librarian's aide and spent roughly two hours in my school's library every day. 
To no avail, I'd literally searched through every book that contained the following keywords, ghost, haunted, spooky, scary, and mystery. But one afternoon as I was shelving books in the biography section, something quite literally hit me on the head. It was a hardback book that had fallen off the top shelf in a section it didn't belong in. As soon as I picked it up and saw the hollow owl on the cover I knew. It was not a book logged into our system. Nobody knew how it got there. I was alone in the library. For you, I just googled your novel ghost story girl pond owl and it was the top result. The Ghost Next Door by Wiley Folk St. John. If I'd just waited 32 years. That's pretty cool. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. The closest I can come to explaining it is that maybe a friend found it, sneaked it into the library, and tossed it over the bookshelf at me. But none of that explains how they knew it was the right book or how they were able to get out without me seeing or hearing them. It was a school library. It wasn't that big. Never seeing my neighbors carrying in groceries. I saw this mentioned the other day and had a moment of WTF. Then realized I don't really watch my neighbors all that often so why would I have seen it lol. I start watching now, and you'll see. We've been watching our neighbors for months because of this phenomenon, and we never see anyone bringing in groceries. And we have tons of neighbors because we're in a densely populated condo complex. Further support for the simulation is one neighbor moving in, and carried in nine different kinds of chairs. No two were the same. going into a room and forgetting what I was going to do, were sims and they cancelled the action. The doorway effect. Basically, your brain is using the transition to a new environment to do some housekeeping and your short-term memory getting wiped is one of those things. My psych professor at Notre Dame, Radvansky, did the experiment that verified this. Was super cool hearing his take on the whole concept. I can sometimes think of a movie or a song. And that bitch either shows up in some form on my suggestions or my actual television. How many times I've said huh, I haven't spoken to X in a while, I should give them a call. And then my phone starts ringing. Right? What the fuck? Yo I was just thinking about calling you. Things would reappear only when I stop looking for it. If that's not a dead giveaway that we're living in a simulation, I don't know what is. And don't forget about hair pins and hair ties. Where do they even go? This happened to me last week. Dropped both of my silver rings on the ground in my small bathroom. I find one but the other one is nowhere to be found. Every day I look and nothing. Then one day I'm sitting on the toilet and there's the ring, right there in front of me. I would have had to walk over it every time I go in and out of the bathroom. I live alone so no one was messing with me and I use only that bathroom during the day and night. How did I not see it for three days and then all of a sudden it appears? I've got an answer for that one. It might not be correct of course. That for jumped into the cuff of your pants. I've had that happen with a very specific piece of hardware lost to the floor at work, only to later appear in my bathroom at home. I used to work in a pharmacy, so I asked about a hundred people for their name and DOB every day. A couple weeks into the job, I mentioned to a coworker how I hadn't had a single customer with the same birthday as me. Got four of them over the next two days. Edit. Another time I realized we were living in a simulation was when I said something online and 40 people replied to me saying the exact same wrong thing about the birthday paradox or the Bader meinhof phenomenon. Lazy devs copy pasting code. I love when the simulation thinks to itself, oh, snap, I've been noticed, I better make up for it, and then it goes way overboard. This reminds me of a situation I experienced very recently. I am an immigrant living in the US. There aren't that many fellow German immigrants where I live. It's not a common occurrence to meet someone from back home. About a month ago I took my child to the zoo. At the gorilla house there was a large gathering of people in front of a window, observing the animals. As I was standing there I heard a couple speaking in German. I made sure I had heard correctly and greeted them in our native tongue. The woman looked extremely shocked and acted standoffish. I hadn't expected such a reaction. She eventually pointed to the window and said, This lady there is also from Germany and just came up to us as well. I look over and see a cheerful young woman wave at me. I honestly thought that the couple I had addressed believed to be on some hidden camera TV show. The husband informed me that they had lived in the States for two years without ever having met someone from Germany. Not once. Only to end up being bombarded by random German people in the span of a couple of minutes. It was extremely bizarre. The pens. I used to go to large corporate meetings a few times a year. They gave out pens and notepads to everyone as if I was going to take notes. I would take pens from empty seats and from co-workers and take them home, a dozen at a time at least. This went on for years. So where are the pens? There should be hundreds of them in my home. I should be able to stand anywhere and look in any direction and see a pen, but no. Then you have people like me with hundreds of pens in my junk drawer. How many actually work? 
Who's controlling me and why did you make me so awkward? Playing on difficult mode. Reminds me of the South Park game difficulty slider. HTTPS colon slash slash com slash a slash jqfxfjf. Someone chose very difficult for my simulation. The USB plug still the wrong way after you turn it over. It's actually a virtual screwdriver that looks like a plug. You just have to turn it over enough times to screw it in. They never patch the animation. Outer space not having sound. Very convenient, dear devs, very convenient. We're lucky we can't hear the sun. There was once a thread here about the experience of being deaf, and multiple deaf people talked about being dumbfounded on learning that the sun doesn't make noise in the sky. For me, the fact that there are humans or conscious beings on a planet capable of understanding the concept and rarity of a moon performing a total solar eclipse. It's an incredible coincidence that intelligent life is able to see a solar eclipse from its host planet by its satellite moon when it wouldn't have been able to if you went back in time millions of years, or even in a billion years into the future as the moon is drifting away from us. It's also weird that we are rare enough to have a moon at the right distance from the earth, with the sun being the right diameter and distance from the earth and moon to be able to be covered and still display a corona. Like, are we just the luckiest people in the universe or what? One of the biggest tourist draws for Earth if it ever becomes part of some galactic federation will be aliens coming to check out our amazing solar eclipses. People who were born deaf but gained hearing later in life, what objects did you expect to make noise? No. Seems like everyone is answering the reverse. My friend was got his hearing at age 6. He swears to this day that he thought flowers would make some sort of noise and that's what attracted bees. Finally a real answer lol. Edit how y'all gonna upvote this literal non-comment 16,000 times. Yeah, this is what I open the thread for. Not me, my good friend who's hard of hearing told me about how before he got hearing aids, he thought that all fridges made a beeping sound, like an alarm, when you open them so the house knows when you're getting something. Turns out his mom just told him that to stop him from eating all their snacks. This is awesome lol. Parenting hack FTW. At least until the kids got hearing aids. To be fair, my Samsung fridge does have an alarm and it beeps loudly if left open for more than a minute. My three-year-old son is deaf, and we just had a visit this morning from his signing teacher who is also deaf herself. She recently had cochlear implants fitted and while we were talking slash signing she said I'm sorry, I can't concentrate, I can hear a horrible constant noise, it's not stopped the whole time I've been here. Turned out it was the rain on my conservatory roof. Greater than turned out it was the rain on my conservatory roof. Ironically one of the most pleasant sounds there is. Maybe it sounds different through the implant. Like being underwater makes things sound different. I bet I'd like different styles of music if I was underwater too. My cousin was born deaf and went through an operation to recover part of his hearing when he was 12. He sometimes uses hearing aids but can get by without them in general. His family had a bunny, Tupu. Of course he had learned about cows mooing, cats meowing etc. before he had his surgery. He was very shocked when he came home and greeted his bunny that it made no sound. It took the longest time for him to understand that bunnies are pretty quiet animals in general. He explained he thought all pets were loud. Honestly, I'm hearing and have a hard time with the sounds of rodents and logomorphs. They're usually not audible to us when they make noise because it's so high pitched. When I can hear them, it's so high that it just doesn't quite sound real. Exceptions for things like guinea pigs that weak in a pretty noticeable way. I assumed you made up the word weak. Google didn't even want to let me search for it. Best thing I've learned today. My old roommate in NYC got implants at. I think he was 25 or 26. He was shocked that the radiators in the house didn't make noise. He could feel them, and was absolutely sure, given their shaking and vibrating from time to time, that they were going to be quite noisy. On the flip side, he was deeply annoyed by the buzz of fluorescent lighting, which he did not expect to make noise. Greater than on the flip side, he was deeply annoyed by the buzz of fluorescent lighting, which he did not expect to make noise. This and old CRT TVs, I have really good high range hearing, and the old CRT straight up hurt my ears. I, yep. There was a CRT in my homeroom for school back in the day that the teacher would turn on for morning announcements, but it would take a few seconds to actually come alive. Got to the point that when I turned my head to look up at it, everyone else would too. They always asked how I knew and I always told them I could hear it. My girlfriend is not deaf, but she is hard of hearing which for her means that she can't hear high frequency sounds. She recently got hearing aids that amplify the frequencies she can't hear and was shocked to find out that birds and crickets chirp. 
To the point that she thought the birds were trying to attack her and was horrified that we were surrounded by millions of bugs when I explained what the crickets were. Greater than my girlfriend is not deaf, but she is hard of hearing which for her means that she can't hear high frequency sounds. She's all about that bass, no trouble. If Megan Trainer did one good thing in her career it was giving you the opportunity to make that joke. Not me, but when I was in high school a bunch of kids would meet in a nearby no man's land and hang out before school started. I spent most of my mornings, loudly, talking to my almost deaf friend. One day he showed up and said he had a new hearing aid. I didn't have to yell at him to get him to hear me anymore, yay. Few minutes later he asked what that noise was. I asked which noise, listening and hearing nothing out of the ordinary. I don't know, it's like a weird beeping, almost musical, really bizarre but actually kind of pleasing. Took me a minute to realize my man was hearing bird song for the first time in his life. Was a pretty cool moment. Edit, I now realize this is maybe the opposite of what was being asked. That's a great story. I was born with tons of fluid in my ears and only had very slight hearing at best. When I was 6 months old, I had a surgery that put tubes in my ears to drain the fluid. My mom says when I came home from surgery, I went to my toy box and shook every toy in it to see what sounds they made. Honestly, it wasn't that serious but did lead to some auditory processing issues and I had to see a speech therapist until I was 7. Crazy what a difference 6 months of hearing makes that early on. Two of my siblings had to get tubes in their ears at a young age, my brother had to see a speech therapist. As kids I had to do a lot of the speaking and translating for him but now he in his 30s and only speaks with a small impediment. My kids are about a year and a half apart. My youngest has some very minor speech issues for which he is in speech therapy. When the youngest was about 3 and the oldest 4.5, my oldest would translate for us all the time. She just knew what he was saying all the time, even though we had a hard time understanding him. If he was having a particularly tough time asking for what he wanted, he would go get her to help. Sometimes she seemed exasperated for being asked one more time, but she truly made that year so much less frustrating for everyone. I had a child friend that gained hearing and she didn't realize you could control the volume of your voice. So when I whispered to hear she said, hang on I think I need to adjust my hearing aid. At first I just thought oh it mustn't be working, until I realized what was going on. She whispered to me for about two weeks solid just to practice. D. 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 Yes she also practiced shouting, but we did that in secluded woodlands. That should be like the beginning of a cute but sad movie. Pixar has entered the chat. Question, if you lose your hearing, can you still have tinnitus? That would be a nightmare to have ringing in your ear without any other sound to mitigate it. Quick Google search brought up. Being hearing impaired doesn't exempt you from these kinds of sounds unfortunately. Deaf people are more likely to have tinnitus. In fact, it's thought to be linked to the damage that caused the deafness itself. Oh darn. That's trouble for me as I age. Hate my tinnitus. Well, after the cochlear implant, I started hearing a lot of things that I never knew existed. Dot, but here are a few things I thought would make a noise, but nope. Edit. To clarify this. 1. I expected the light bulbs to hiss or flickering sound when you turn them on. I was so disappointed. 2. I thought you could hear your eyes close, blink but there is no sound when you close your eyelids. No whoosh. 3. You know how wind makes a noise going through trees? I thought it would make more noises going through hair. Nope. 4. Now I could hear soft sounds, but I still get spooked when I see a bug crawling, and I don't hear it. They don't make a noise. At. All. 5. Pooping does not make a sound, only the splash into the toilet. I thought the body makes a noise to push it out. I was disappointed. Ah someone who answered the question the right way around ha ha. Also something semi-related to one of them. I remember someone once saying when they were a kid, lying in bed, they kept hearing this sort of scraping sound but when they sat up it stopped. They were really freaked out thinking it was some monster somewhere. Turned out it was her eyelashes brushing against her pillow every time she blinked. When I was a kid I woke up one summer in the middle of the night and heard what I thought for sure was someone using my hula hoop in the backyard. It went on and on and on, I couldn't believe it. Then I realized it was my dad snoring down the hall in his bedroom. Not personally but one of my friends basically said how the fuck do you people stand all this noise? You learn to filter. I'm half deaf. In crowded and noisy places it's gonna be weird for me if you yell from a distance. No triangulation. Hmm. Again obligatory not me but my dad progressively went deafer as life went on and was almost 100% deaf by around age 20. He got a cochlear implant when I was around 7 years old, put them in, asked my mom are the kids always this damn loud? 
and proceeded to take the cochlear implant off so he didn't have to listen to my little brother and I yelling. Always thought that was funny. Honestly, being deaf when having young children probably makes parenting more tolerable, ha ha. Definitely, any toy that makes noise gets donated or loses its batteries. To say nothing of the screaming. No My dad was born with severe hearing loss but it wasn't detected until he was 50. His parents just thought he was ignorant if he didn't answer them. It's quite sad actually, his parents definitely failed him. He is also dyslexic and it's affected every part of his life and self-worth etc. Anywho, my mom told him he needed a hearing test because the TV was starting to deafen her. He thought oh it's just years of loud music and using a shotgun occasionally. So he has this hearing test and some other tests etc. and gets told he was actually born deaf in one ear and significant loss in another. He can't hear phonics. You can imagine his problems through life. He finally gets hearing aids and the first day he sits down to eat a packet of crisps. He absolutely flips out. What the F is that noise? Holy SHXT my head is exploding. We had to explain you can hear the crunching of food etc and some foods are louder than others etc. It was heartbreaking to see what he's missed out on. Now he only uses his hearing aids after a good nag from my mom. We still have to put up with his noisy eating but he's back to ignorance is bliss lol. My wife always had terrible vision but her mom and dad didn't take her seriously. By second grade mom finally took her to an optometrist and when she walked out with her first ever pair of glasses yelled oh my god, there are leaves on the trees, that's the green part, oh my god, grass are tiny individual leaves too. Until then she only saw trees and grass as a blob of green. Mom cried. I think the vast majority of people who first get glasses comment about trees having leaves, I know I did. And when did you realize you married the wrong person? When I realized if we weren't dating I wouldn't have wanted to be his friend. This hurts. I realized that I was hiding good news from her because I knew she would make me feel bad about it. I hope she was going to grow up and stop being selfish and childish. She never did. This was my ex. As soon as I graduated and starting chasing my dreams, I would withhold telling her any small wins or successes because she was so insecure. She was never genuinely excited for my wins or goals. I knew I made the correct choice proposing to my wife because when I get raises or promotions she celebrates for me. She does something special for me, like cook my fave meal, or go get an ice cream cake, or take me out to eat and surprise me with some of my friends there. Oh, every day, every day she makes me a fresh pitcher of tea and brews an iced coffee for me to grab when I wake up. And if I have a hard day, worked my ass off, when I finally come downstairs, she can see what I need in my expression. She'll beckon me over and I'll plob right into her lap, she scratches my back, massages my scalp, and I juicy lay there in ASMR bliss. She's seriously the best, I try hard to not take her for granted. This post made me think of a quote by Robin Williams. I used to think the worst thing in life was to end up all alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to end up with people that make you feel all alone. World's Greatest Dad, a phenomenal black comedy to check out if you've never seen it. That movie ripped me to pieces. I only saw it once, I'll never watch it again but I remember so many little details of that movie. What an impact. Not married but together for years. Got diagnosed with cancer and she kinda shut off. She then decided to leave several months later. At an appointment I was officially one year clear, which is a milestone. I realized I was alone through a lot of it. She never wanted anything to do with it. Was a revelation to myself that the relationship breakdown wasn't all because of me. Got my 3 years test this weekend, blood tests and scans etc. Current GF is driving me and then taking me out to lunch afterwards. Hell of an upgrade. Congrats to you, you made it out alive. My wife bolted after I injured my back last fall. Had some good friends support me through it with her nowhere in sight. And yet, I'm still trying to make it work with her. Don't ask me why. You only get one go at life my friend, do you really want to waste your best remaining years pursuing someone that, sorry to be harsh but, clearly doesn't care about you? I know it's scary starting over, familiar feels safe, but you're honestly missing out on someone that truly loves you, and for what? When I came home from the ER after being diagnosed with a severe lung disorder, and she immediately left me with the kids so she could go out drinking with friends, her exact words were I need you to make them dinner, I'm running late to meet up with everyone. I feel you. Few years back, I had a 104 degree fever, passing in and out of consciousness, talking in my sleep, etc. I was in a bad way. My now ex-wife wakes me to ask if I'm okay and tells me that she's going shopping with her friend right now. We had a 5-year-old that she left in my care despite my state. So she could go shopping. At 2pm I finally managed to stay awake long enough to feed our child after the poor kid tried to wake me for the 20th time. 
He was also very excited about this Christmas kids party thing I'd promised him a week earlier I'd take him to. She could have taken him, but no. Shopping. I managed to take a bunch of painkillers and anti-inflammatory drugs, load up on sugars just enough to take him out cause I felt so fucking bad for him that day. Anyway, I divorced her a couple years later. There was a lot wrong, but this one event is the one that sent me over the edge. Edit, damn wasn't expecting this to spawn so much response. Hey, everyone saying I'm a good dad, thank you. Truly made me smile after a long day. For those who've had similar experiences, I'm sorry. But hey, better to be alone and healthy than in a toxic relationship. Much love. Removed. Six months after our wedding when I found out about the emotional, he says only emotional but I'm pretty sure it was physical too, affair through text messages. He had sent his affair partner screenshots of my texts to him in which I was begging him to talk to me and tell me what was wrong. They both proceeded to make fun of my desperation to fix my marriage and his affair partner said something along the lines of poor valiant, she doesn't know anything and keeps begging you for attention and affection. The moment I read those words I realized how big of a mistake I had made. How is that not a red flag for her? Like do these people think they're going to have successful relationships with the people who are cheating on their spouse? They villainize you and have a certain perception of you that they fully get on board with and anything you do or say is stupid, desperate, controlling, abusive etc. Whatever suits the narrative your partner came up with to justify cheating on you and wanting to leave you. It is ridiculous but I've found that once that happens, the absolute best thing to do is to leave and move on. They'll implode like a badly built submarine sooner than if you keep trying. One day I realized I had become a smaller version of myself. Out of all the answers here this one hit me the hardest. Yeah damn, I'm about a year past a really tough breakup, and this hits hard. My friends all tell me they like the new me, and it certainly feels easier to be me. I don't know why I ever let it be reduced. I think she left me with a bit of imposter syndrome, but it turns out I'm fucking dope. When he was messaging a side chick on our wedding day and boy did it go sideways from there. Yeah I'm at my lame wedding today. Maybe we can chill tomorrow? No. Apparently he was just on vacation with his brother and sister-in-law and couldn't wait to see what else that mouth can do along with oh so many more including video and pictures. That continued to roll over his face up phone the whole reception. My dude. When I lost twins and he dropped me off at the hospital to get an operation to have my babies removed. He dropped me off at the hospital bleeding and went for a party with his friends. Edit. Fix typo. ETA. To those that asked, I left this man years ago. I'm doing well now. Thank you for the award, kind words and chats. I honestly didn't expect this to get so many responses but I did my best to respond to a lot of you. Unfortunately, this is will never stop being a sore topic for me so I cannot engage any further. Love and healing to those that have experienced this too. I hope you're in a better place now and if you're not yet take it from me. It takes time but you will be. I'm so sorry for your loss, that's awful. Thank you. Engaged not quite married yet. When I had been on mandatory bed rest and caring for our infant son, after having emergency surgery for nearly bleeding to death after a miscarriage, and he came home from work and looked me dead in the face and said why aren't the fucking dishes done. Called my mom the next morning and told her I was leaving. Hightailed it out of there two weeks later. My mother tells that when she returned from the hospital with me, my older sister was wearing a diaper that hadn't been changed in days and the house was a mess. Before even asking to see the new baby, father asked what was for dinner. It took her a few years to get out, but she knew in that moment it was over. It was a good decision. He always was exactly that uncaring, inconsiderate, selfish, etc. This angers me to read. I realized like 5 years into our 19 year marriage. But the nail that made me leave was when my ex said that our children hadn't earned his love and that shook my whole foundation. Literally speechless for two days and then I started thinking, wondering if I had earned his love yet, and I couldn't stop those kind of thoughts, you don't earn love, it is freely given, especially to children. Edited for confusion, I realized early on he wasn't right for me, but we had three kids, and our youngest is special needs, so I stayed. He didn't make this statement until two years ago when I asked why I never heard him say I love you to the kids while they were growing up, and that's when he told me about the earning. I asked for the separation and divorce shortly after that. Children have earned your love as soon as you put them on this planet. That is the least they deserve. Yes. Or please don't put them on this planet. They don't deserve to not be loved. Ada there are too many ways to mess up children. When I got her to admit she was having an affair. 10 years married, 2 kids. What a mess. She followed it up a month or two later telling me she never loved a person like she does with new partner. 
So welcome to Divorce Land. Population, me. I'm here with you. Same story. 23 years married, 4 kids. He never actually admitted to the cheating, even with all the hardcore evidence submitted to the attorneys. Just said it was all my fault. I was a horrible person, horrible parent, horrible wife, horrible human. Yep, his cheating was my fault. After almost two years of intense weekly betrayal trauma therapy I am in a better place, but I will never trust or be with anyone again. I wouldn't survive another betrayal. Hugs, stranger, therapy is wonderful, time is even greater. I understand completely, it was years before I felt whole again. It does come, though. I almost did, and tbh, there were a lot of red flag prior to this, but this was the catalyst. We'd been dating 4 years, slated to be married in 8 months. I noticed he was making lots of likes and comments on Britney's MySpace. Nothing huge or obvious. Then not long after, he locked his phone, but I managed to see he was also getting MSGS regularly from someone also named Britney. I had suspected, but no proof now. I worked swing and nights at the time. Came home early one night to him in our bed, with you know who, Britney. First thing this fucker says when I walk in on them is, get this. There was no exchange of fluids, I promise babe. Later Brittany got a hold of me on MySpace, we met up. She had no idea I was even in the picture. We're still friends. I kicked him and his fluids out of my house. The end. ETA, Brittany let me read all over their correspondence via MySpace and text. She was very upfront about not realizing he was with someone. I will admit Brittany was not exceptionally bright but he had this thing all worked out. He stuffed all my stuff in a closet, even removed photos of us from the walls. I don't wear makeup, and at the time didn't own much stuff. We were poor, I was the only one working. He kept getting fired for sexual harassment. Red flag, I know. He also kept the house dark while they watched a movie, then moved to the bed. Said it made it romantic. Ada too, to clarify, I knew he sucked in keeping a job. He kept getting let go, it wasn't until this shit show happened that I learned why he had been fired from previous jobs. I will freely admit though, I was naive and ignorant. There were a lot of signs I should have noticed. First and foremost, how he actually met me. We worked in the same retail store, and he made a lot of advances and borderline lewd comments to get my attention. I didn't pay attention to the fact that he also did slash said these things to other women I worked with. I was 18 when we met, not used to getting any attention from men, and had pretty shit self-esteem. In the four years we were together I was honestly miserable. So miserable I even committed myself once. I also thought he was the best I was getting. It was a really fucked up four years of my life. Parents who tried their best to raise their kids to be good humans but they turned out to be jerks, what do you wish you did differently? You don't have to win every power struggle. I don't have jerk kids, but I do think I've learned a lot from having four very different kids, and I think too many parents won. Think the same strategies work for all kids, e, rule consequence behavior falls in line, rinse and repeat, and 2, focus on the behavior rather than the cause. If you have a kid who doesn't respond to your parenting style slash philosophy, you should rethink your approach, it's not all the kid's fault. Some kids will burn their lives to the ground to make a point. I have one like that. For too long, it was a vicious cycle of. Kid acts out I punish kid is angry. Acts out more I punish harder kid is angrier. Acts out even more I punish even harder. And on and on and on and on. Something needs to break the cycle. For instance, if your kid is challenging your authority, it's usually a bid for more independence. They're trying to be more mature, and they want your adult respect. You don't have to excuse the bad behavior. Consequences are okay but you also have to look for ways to help your kid get that need met. You don't have to tie it to the actual incident, so it doesn't look like a reward. Give them more responsibility for themselves. Let him walk to school alone if he doesn't get to do that. Quit bugging him so much about what he does with his free time, even if you think he should be getting more fresh air. Look for any opportunity to let him choose something. We're going to do something as a family on Sunday. You can choose what we do, or where we eat or whatever. Don't tell him when he has to do his chores. Let him set his Saturday schedule. I need you to mow the lawn and do the dishes today. You can do it any time between now and 6 p.m. If you address the cause of the behavior, it's going to do way more to correct a bad behavior, and you'll also get more respect from your kid. If you insist on winning every power struggle, your kid is going to see everything as a fight. Edit, I need to give my wife credit for helping me understand this over the years. She's not only a great mom and wife, she's also a really good therapist. She's gained a lot of perspective working with other kids and parents and working on those relationships. As a parent with a sometimes challenging kid, I greatly appreciate this comment. I will screenshot it and save it for later. My kid is ADHD, as do I, and I've so learned the value of approaching him from where he is at in the moment. I have a son who just turned 5 and I can see all the hallmarks of ADHD, which I have, and most people in my family have. He behaves so much like my younger sister did when she was young, 
And I found myself going through the cycle mentioned above, bad behavior punishment worse behavior worse punishment, just like my parents did with my sister. Recently I've been trying to connect with the person who I was when I was younger when I wasn't in charge and my sister would calm down for me and listen to me, it's helping so much, I still need my kid to stop throwing shit, makes my blood absolutely boil, but we are making progress. Kids are fucking exhausting and I hope I don't end up accidentally raising an asshole. Generally speaking if you try to teach your kids something and not be the example, you might as well not have wasted your time. Deleted. Ha same. My dad and I both do hardwood flooring. My business is infinitely more successful than his. Even though he trained me as a kid, I'm way better now than he will ever be. He cuts every single corner he can and it always bites him in the ass. Not only did my grandparents buy him a house but they paid the mortgage for 15 to 20 years or something. I bought my own home with my wife. My dad will sit there and tell you he's better in every way possible but it's just not true. I love him but he sure is a pain in the ass. Not me, but my parents have discussed what they wish they had done differently for my brother in order to prevent him from becoming a violent, homeless, drug-addicted snotball of a person. They wish they had sent him to therapy before problems ever started, and that they had reacted quicker and sent him sooner when they did. They wish they hadn't yelled so much at all of us. That they had been more patient and forgiving of our mistakes. They wish a lot. That's sad. I'm sorry. Thank you. I can make jokes about it now. It's been so long since I've even seen him. But it does still hurt to lose a sibling no matter how you spin it. The mom of one of the Columbine shooters gave a TED talk about this. She wrote a book called A Mother's Reckoning about all the signs she missed. I think every parent needs to read this book before their kids hit their teenage years. And if anyone's wondering, Sue Klebel donated all of her profits from the book to mental health charities. I have one child, the youngest, who I'm starting to worry about. He's tall, athletic, attractive and very charismatic. I feel like it's a constant battle between teaching him respect and humility and the worship he gets at school. At his age he's not prepared to deal with all these peers who want his attention, tell him how great he is, and the girls lining up to talk to him. Yeah, don't we all wish we had this problem as teens. Anyway, it's a struggle. He's gotten cocky and thinks life will just keep on treating him like a king. And maybe it will, he's got the type of personality that makes people want him around. But he needs to treat others with the same respect he expects for himself. Confidence is good but it needs to be combined with kindness. Our other children are very level-headed and what we feel are good people. I hope we get to properly tech this to our youngest and that he takes it to heart and chooses to be a good person. Greater than he's gotten cocky and thinks life will just keep on treating him like a king. Different situation, but being effing smart made school a joke, the real world isn't school, harsh lesson learned there. Yep. I remember having a teacher senior year pull me aside and tell me as much. Said I've been coasting because I'm smart, but that will change in college if I don't start putting an effort. He was right but I still didn't learn my lesson and put in effort. I wish I knew that some grandparents shouldn't be allowed to have a relationship with a vulnerable, easily manipulated child. I wish I knew it was okay to cut people out of your life. My wife died when my son was 3 months old, last time my in-law saw him was at her funeral. I moved, changed numbers and just dropped off the map as far as they knew. Saw how their kids turned out, they weren't getting near mine. I'm so sorry about your wife, man, I can't even imagine going through that. I sincerely wish you're fine and your kid loves you as much as she did. I'm speaking as a teacher, but I've seen wildly different siblings. I think parents need to get a handle on that dynamic. A lot of perfectionist older siblings and younger ones who can't achieve at that level and act out instead to find how they can earn attention. Yep. People need to stop treating kids as carbon copies of their older siblings. And I say this as an eldest child who differs greatly in personality and interests from my younger sibling. It's not fair to anyone, least of all the kid who has to deal with being measured by someone else's standard. Everyone is their own person. Even the twins I've known had different personalities and interests if one cared to observe. Same. I was a high school senior when my younger sibling was a freshman. Everyone expected them to be exactly like me when in reality we were always polar opposites. Definitely was a very negative influence for them. In my opinion, the one defining characteristic of bad parents is being resentful of their own children. Resentful that they took some of their freedom. Resentful of their youth. Resentful of their opportunities. Resentful of their intelligence. Resentful of their beauty. Resentful of their possessions. Resentful of their education. Resentful of their accomplishments. Resentful of their happiness. Etc. I think this is far more common than most people realize. These parents may consciously provide for their kids while they unconsciously sabotage them. 
The kids pick up on this and end up aspiring to their parents' unspoken expectations. Good parents want their kids to exceed their own achievements and, most importantly, to be happy. Good parents are empathetic to their children. They're happy when their kids are happy. They're sad when their kids are sad. Resentful parents don't really want their kids to be happy unless they credit the parents for their happiness. No achievement belongs to the kids, but every failure does. Holy shit, this is my mom. She was a teen mother and never owned up to regretting her decision, but it came out in her contempt for me. If I wasn't popular enough I was disappointing, but if my teachers bragged about me she seemed annoyed, the constant comments about her body versus mine. The contempt was in everything she did, but she would make a big show of us being besties. We haven't talked in 7 years and going NC was like coming up for air. My mom to 9 years old me I gave up my entire life for you, I wasn't ready to be a mother and everyone wanted me to have an abortion but I chose not to, I know that feeling of contempt she had for me all too well. It's been 5 years NC. Be very careful WHO you have kids with. If I could do it all over again, I would have chosen better. They ended up with one responsible parent who was completely overwhelmed trying to do the job of two people. My parents. My mom was hyper involved while my dad immediately detached the minute we stopped being cute and started having opinions. I see him doing it to his grandkids now. Mom put us in every event slash sport slash extracurricular. Dad never attended and often had no idea what we did with our time. Mom pushed us to excel academically and we often were doing super high level classes. Dad assumed we were lazy because we were often tired and didn't have jobs. Hard when you have a double class load as a high school freshman. Dad was also pretty verbally abusive. To me, at least. Mom knew we had a negative relationship but never pried and never got involved. She didn't slash doesn't know how far it went, to be fair. Which also sucked. I think my mom would have been an awesome parent if she had an equal partner but instead we had an absentee and someone too involved in being everything to actually listen to what was going on. You might like the book Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents by Lindsay Gibson. I worked with youth for a while in a poorer rural part of America and in my anecdotal experience there are two types of kids that can turn into bad humans. One, they've just had tough lives and no good role models. If you get to know them you realize they are just normal kids that have never been given the tools, opportunity, or encouragement to act any different. If no one figures out how to intervene it becomes a pattern of life for them that spirals out of control. 2. Kids that never suffer the consequences of their actions. They tend to have really nice caregivers who have a knack for getting their kids out of trouble. When I say they don't suffer consequences I mean literally. Their parents do their homework, their parents lie for them, their parents don't ever tell them no. Their caregivers also don't supervise them but whenever anything happens they are easily manipulated by their child and take whatever their child says as gospel truth without question. And although the parents don't supervise their children they seem all too willing to give them everything their child asks for. Within the confines of their economic class, the caregivers are somehow both emotionally neglectful but also always there to help their child out of a jam. In a way that feels like they want to be manipulated by their child. Kids in the first category will do something bad and you go, how could they be so stupid? When kids in the second category do something bad your reaction is, it's only a matter of time before they kill someone. I knew a lot of young adults that got in trouble with the law, but it was only people from category 2 that got tried for murder and manslaughter. 